Thank you, Henry. Just working with two mics, we'll see if we get it all done. Uh, a couple purposes here, the digestive physiology of pigs meetings, which we uh, summarized in the proceedings that you have, are one of the premier meetings for a lot of faculty members uh, in the swine area. In the swine area, I'm speaking more broadly than just swine nutrition. Uh, quite a few physiologists as well as microbiologists uh, certainly anybody involved in nutrition is very much interested in that. I did want to give you a history of it as well as give you a history of the U.S. involvement in this international meeting that's held every three years. Uh, as I end my uh, relatively short presentation up here, uh, you'll see one of the main reasons why we're doing this also in addition to giving you an introduction to it. Uh, initially, uh, the meetings were set up in 1979. If you don't know Dr. Brody's name, then you definitely aren't a swine nutritionist. So if you're a master's or a student don't know that name, you've got some learning to do yet. Um, held every three years and primarily in Europe starting out. Uh, this meeting in 1979, there were 33 faculty members from a variety of uh, institutions uh, that were involved in swine research and wanted to share the effect of the, the gut on their particular research. If you have a few years on you, you'd recognize many of those names, such as Graham Lowe. If you do any reading in digestive physiology, that name will come up. Teresa Zabrowski. Uh, Teresa is from Poland, and she uh, came over on a sabbatical to Texas A&M, and there's quite a few people here who've learned uh, ileal cannulation techniques as a result of the time through Texas A&M and what Teresa's done for the U.S. Uh, swine industry. It moved out of uh, Europe and was in North America for the first time in 2003, then it went back to the, uh, uh, Europe and then in 2012 to the United States for the first time. It's had a variety, uh, it has grown. It's been in a variety of places. They're always nice places, so this is as much an advertisement for you to consider this uh, in the future, even from an industry standpoint, because it's a tremendous networking place. It gives you a chance to talk to international people uh, that are doing the research. But when it was in Banff, by now it had grown to 225 attendees. Then in Denmark in 2006, 291. In Spain, again in uh, 291 in 2009. Then it came to the United States in 2012. Uh, we were at Keystone, Colorado. Uh, a very nice setting again. Now it's over 400 people. This thing is getting so big it's very hard to handle. And you're trying to do your normal faculty job and as well uh, organize a uh, conference that has over 400 attendees from 28 countries. Uh, 250 abstracts, this is not in my normal skill set and is, is something that you definitely need a lot of colleagues to partner with you on that. Uh, back again to how this came about to the U.S. in 2009, and you look at this, the names and the countries involved, this is 30 years that that's gone on. In 2009 it looked like it was not going to have a host for the next, uh, next meeting. At that time, there were probably about eight to 10 of us that were there in Spain. Uh, Jim Pettigrew was there, I uh, remember that. And we, we heard that the ones who had, uh, probably were going to have it in 2012 were not able to do it. And so you know, everybody turned and looked to the US and we said, okay, uh, we'll do it. And as a result of that, uh, Here's some individuals. You'll see we have true North American representation here. Some Canadians, we've got Mexico represented there, a lot of universities, we've got industry represented there. These are the people that stepped up and said, okay, this 30 year thing that was started by people that we, in grad school, we studied their work, we know the names, we know the history, we'll keep it going. So again, it's uh, as I opened the, the day today, talked about partnerships among people uh, a lot of things we do in our jobs other than just our job to keep this whole swine thing going. Uh, we had a, just a few pictures from Keystone. We had a lot of visitors there. Some of them were more than two-legged. Uh, it was a wonderful setting. Uh, every time, uh, the last night, we have a gala dinner, and it, it tends to be whatever the country's, uh, some of the themes are. We went with a Western theme, uh, so we had a, a cookout there. 
uh, had some things that people could do. So some of the Europeans liked the shooting guns. They didn't get many chances of that. They were there and took part of that. We had some horses out there, a few roping activities for those who wanted to try some of the cowboy stuff. Oh yeah, and the Europeans, they really liked uh, shooting the guns. So anyway, we had a little dancing that went on. You sit by the fireplace and, uh, and uh, just talk. Some more dancing. Oh, did I mention the Europeans? They really like <laughs> Went all Clint Eastwood on us, you know? So anyway, they, the DPP meetings are led by an international steering committee. Uh, here is the committee that met in 2012. Not everyone was there. But you see a lot of people that you recognize. Bach Knudsen from uh, Denmark actually spoke at these meetings two or three years ago. There's Ron Ball. Uh, he spoke at these meetings also. Uh, here we have Spain, uh, Joaquin Rufo. Uh, both Ron and Joaquin are no longer on the International Steering Committee. This thing's going on, the younger ones have to take over and some of the older ones uh, are leaving. Here's Case DeLonga from, from Canada, spoke at these meetings also. So again, a part of these meetings are to try to bring good people to you that have an international reputation. I think we're able to do that. Uh, in the process of doing this, we had to set up a nonprofit. Uh, organization. This was set up in the state of Illinois. Uh, FAST helped us to set that up. It still exists. We meet yearly and talk about the next meetings that are coming up. Uh, this uh, group sponsors now a speaker at the Midwest Swine, uh, Midwest uh, ASAS meetings. We had our first speaker last March. Uh, we brought in um, uh, Jürgen Zentek from Germany for that. We will keep doing that. We're also sponsoring uh, some grad student travel to the meetings. So again, some of these are the same as we're on our local steering committee that did the 2012, but you see the representation uh, there that's keeping this going. Uh, 2015, we went to Poland, and Tom's going to give you a little bit of a flavor in the next few minutes about the type of stuff that is presented. There is both very applied research, there's some very basic stuff that goes on, but a variety of things that go on. So this was a setting in Poland, uh, an old castle, uh, very interesting history, uh, especially related to World War II and Nazis moving in. So again, you get a flavor of the country. Uh, there's the country distribution for the uh, attendees. Very happy here for the United States. We're up over 30 people. For this being such a high power meeting, there has not been historically a lot of representation from the U.S. The U.S. doesn't travel across the water very much. So when we were in Spain, there was eight to 10 of us. Now we're at the first time back in Europe and we're up to uh, 30. So we think the awareness is growing. Certainly that's a part of our wanting to have a speaker at the Midwest Animal Science meetings is to grow the profile of the DPP meetings. There's the abstracts. You see, we like just like our papers to the journal, we're getting a lot of stuff out of Asia. Uh, so that's, that's growing a lot too. With regard to the U.S. representation to the International Steering Committee, JTN, many of you will know that name at, at the Mark uh, Center in Nebraska. Uh, he was our first representative and he maintained that position until 2005. Uh, upon his death, I assumed the position. I did, have done it now for about uh, nine years and been involved in the decisions of where the meetings will be next, what the themes will be, and now uh, Part of what this meeting is doing in this presentation is to make you aware of the handing over of the reins to Tom Berkey. Tom is going to be taking over and being our representative to the International Steering Committee and uh, taking things uh, forward in the future. Uh, I will still be chairing the DPP North America Committee, uh, looking to the future when it comes back to the U.S. again. Uh, but Tom will be the one sitting on the uh, decision-making meetings there uh, when the, every three years when the steering committee meets and plans for uh, the next meeting. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tom and uh, let him tell you a bit about the type of research that has been presented at these meetings. Uh, thank you, Merlin, and um, thank you to the committee for inviting me to uh, talk about DPP, the DPP meetings uh, over the last year, that happened last year in May, or this year in May, I guess. Um, and uh, thank you, Merlin, for uh, 
I guess, initiating my involvement in the uh, DPP International Steering Committee. It's a, it's a pleasure to be part of it, and it's an exciting group, and I think there's a lot of opportunity that um, we can explore uh, with that group. So basically, what I wanted to do today, and, and before I start, I wanted to ask for a little bit of latitude um, with two respects. One is I took some liberties with uh, the proceedings of the DPP, DPP meetings and some of the figures and things that I'm going to show you today. And also I want to um, ask for a little bit of latitude in terms of the interpretation of some of the studies that I'm going to give you an overview of. Um, hopefully that I convey an accurate uh, interpretation of their message. Um, but like I said, uh, just a little bit of latitude please. So um, this is the outline and uh, as, I, as we talk about the meetings, um, it was basically uh, subdivided into several different aspects. There was a pre-conference symposium, there was a keynote lecture, and there were basically five sections of um, abstracts, abstract presentations, and then there was a post-conference workshop, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, Merlin already gave you an introduction of the kind of the mission of, the, of DPP and so forth, so I'm going to skip over this. But um, you know, obviously, uh, it's related to digestive physiology, and I think it's um, it's evolved over the years. And I think one of the things that I took away this year was that there is much more emphasis on you know interactions between the gut microbi microbial populations, uh, nutrition, and digestive physiology, as well as uh, immune response. Um, this was the uh, pre-conference symposium, and I put all of the abstracts that were in this particular um, symposium just because I, I thought it was interesting. Okay. Um, you know, you can you get a feel for the different um, topic areas, I guess. And there were uh, a couple a couple talks on uh, mycotoxins. Um, uh, on immunity of piglets and so forth. What I'm going to, the one I'm going to review a little bit had to do with the uh, um, U.S. pork industry and, and new developments and future feed additives given by um, uh, Mike Coelho, and I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, from uh, BSAF. So, um, kind of the, the, the overall message of this talk was that, you know, there's a lot of different feed additives out there and we need to come together to uh, formulate more of an overall plan in terms of how these uh, additives are administered. Um, but before I get to that, so, you know, obviously over the years you can, you think about antimicrobial or antibiotic administration and the response that we get has obviously decreased over the years. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that. Um, the, the message that um, Mike gave was that one of the main reasons is probably due to antimicrobial res resistance. Um, this was a paper that was recently published um, 2015, and I believe this was out of Princeton University. Um, but they, they used a, a Bayesian st statistical model to predict basically um, AGP uh, use in the future. And so in this model they put livestock densities, economic projections, uh, estimates of antimicrobial consumption uh, throughout the world. And basically the, the, the conclusion was that the global consumption of antimicrobials is going to increase by 67 percent over that period from 2010 to 2030, I believe, yes. And then um, their conclusion was that mostly, most of this increase is going to be to shifts in farming practices in, in middle in income countries. Um, obviously, um, there's a lot of things that are associated with that, but I thought that was interesting. Um, but this uh, decline in average day of the gain feed conversion ratio when we feed pigs antibiotics is probably, or at least partially, associated with antimicrobial resistance. So thus stems the need for looking for alternatives, still looking for alternatives. Um, if you couple that with demand for antibiotic-free production systems, um, there's a lot of different requirements for that. Um, and, I, and again, this is uh, all things that uh, Mike talked about at the meeting. Uh, closed herds, uh, pig flow down the pyramid versus up the pyramid or horizontally, uh, facility uh, uh, ramifications, biosecurity, obvious, these are all obvious things. Um, but again, the thing that I want to focus on here the most probably today is uh, in terms of gut health. And so, um, again, one of the, the points that Mike made at the end of his talk was that, um, you know, what is gut health? Um, obviously, that's gut health. Gut health has a lot of different definitions. Uh, I think the main hurdle that we have to overcome is how do you quantify it? Um, we don't know how to quantify gut health. And so, 
Um, and then when you when you when you couple gut health of a healthy animal, what's gut health of a, a sick animal? And that adds another layer of uh, complexity to it. So again, the challenge is how do you coordinate these additives to maximize gut health? And, and Mike referred to three pillars of, uh, or three, three strategies, if you will, in terms of reducing uh, nutritional factors, reducing pathogens, reducing intestinal immune stimulation. And so all of those things um, come into play. The, um, the keynote lecture was delivered by um, uh, Knud, Eric Bach Knudsen, and I just want to touch on a couple things that he, he talked about um, at, the, uh, at the meetings. Um, obviously, um, this is a review of carbohydrates, but um, you know, the thing that he really emphasized and uh, kind of the, the, the meat of his talk was, had to do with resistant starches and carbohydrate-derived metabolites, so I want to mention those specifically. Um, Eric, or Knud, Eric Bach Knudsen shared some data that um, I think is, you know, obviously fairly, fairly well accepted at this point in that if you feed carbohydrates, feed fiber to pigs, you're going to get changes in uh, microbial populations and that you also get changes in short chain fatty acid production in the, in the lower gut. The most interesting thing to me, and I think an area of opportunity, has to do with this idea of carbohydrate-derived um, signaling molecules. And so when you feed fiber, when you feed different types of carbohydrates, um, like resistant starches, for example, they're going to be fermented. And in that um, fermentation vat, if you will, obviously a different fermentation vat in, in non-ruminant species than, than ruminant species, but there's still fermentation that takes place. And so in that fermentation or those fermentation products, there's metabolites. And so this was a uh, genome-wide transcriptional profiling experiment that was done. And so in this experiment, they discovered that there are um, genes that affect or increase fatty acid uh, beta oxidation, increase uh, TCA cycle intermediates, and that decrease innate and adaptive immune response. And so um, this is an area I don't think we know quite um, enough about, and that um, is definitely an area that can be explored. The, uh, the first... Um, session, if you will, had to do with functional ingredients and feed additives. And so, um, again, I just picked out a few of the different abstracts to, to give you an overview on, to hopefully to give you a, a flavor, if you will, of what, uh, what's talked about at these meetings. And so um, there wasn't really any rhyme or reason to how I picked them other than I thought they were interesting and I thought they would give, maybe hopefully stimulate some ideas among the group. So this particular um, abstract, um, Carr and others from Wageningen University in Netherlands, um, had to do with uh, approximating amino acid uh, composition and biofunctional properties of different or alternative protein sources. And this was um, this is some work basically I think kind of at the forefront of. Um, um, future experiments. And so in this particular experiment, they used uh, not so much novel, novel or alternative sources, but um, mainstream sources that hopefully can be used as kind of a, um, a platform, if you will, to look at more alternative sources in the future. And so um, she wanted to characterize and uh, quantify these individual proteins in a, in a complex feed matrix using a